Hello everyone and welcome back. Today we are going to discuss a generalization of the winding number to higher dimensional spheres. And using this theory, we're going to get a lot of cool results about uh, maps between spheres, how they behave, especially about the antipodal map. Moreover, this theory is going to let us define our final and my favorite homology theory, which is going to be next class, which works on CW complexes called CW homology. So I think uh, you're going to find some of these applications really cool, and let's get to it. So let's remember that the homology of SN is very simple. It's Z in the zeroth degree and the nth degree, and otherwise, oh, sorry, it's Z in the zeroth degree and the nth degree, and it's zero otherwise. And let's remember that we saw this using this Meyer-Viatora sequence, where we basically suspended SN, uh, and we had the top hemisphere plus a little bit, and the bottom hemisphere plus a little bit, and these intersect in SN minus 1 cross I, which might as well be SN minus 1 for everything algebraic topological. So uh, we got this little bit in the meyer viatora sequence, which said that the homology group of SN was equal to the homology group of N minus 1 of SN minus 1. And so, so there's a nice morphism there. And we're, we're going to use this again. Um, so let's also remember that a map between spaces induces a map F star uh, on each homology level, right? So let's just put these two facts together in the most obvious way. Well, uh, a map F from an n-dimensional sphere to itself induces a map F star from hn of sn to hn of sn. And of course, these groups are both isomorphic to z. Uh, so homomorphisms of the integers are especially simple. So such maps, f star from z to z, are completely determined by f star of 1. So uh, here's our definition, which will be the central focus for today's class. A map f from Sn to Sn is a degree n map if f star from hn of sn to hn of sn sends one, let's write it this way, has f star of one is equal to n. So we've seen some examples of this. Uh, although never quite in this context, but here's the prototypical example and the example that really motivated this definition historically. If f from s1 to s1 is the usual map, f of z is equal to z to the n, so these are unit complex numbers, and if I take them to the nth power, they're still unit complex numbers, right? Uh, then, f has degree n. And here's how you can see this. Well, I think I'll give the more hand-wavy, intuitive uh, way, though there's a lot, lot more rigorous ways where you can go between the isomorphism of the fundamental group and the first homology group. But the intuitive way is uh, here is our generator of h1, it sends this one simplex, just all the way around the circle exactly once. So uh, I guess I should call this delta 1, and I should call this map sigma. Well, 
Now let's do z to the end of this and see what happens. Well, let me just do z cubed, for example. Now it's going to run around, and then it's going to run around again, then it's going to run around again, and then it's going to come back to where it started. Well, if we break this up into a sum of three simplices, what we see is this first simplex is the generator of the first homology. The second simplex is the generator of first homology. And no surprise, the third simplex is again the generator of first homology. So it's a bit of a messy picture, but it's, it's probably better if you just like trace it out with your finger. So this sends sigma to three sigma. So it's degree three. Great, so let's get some straightforward properties out of the way. First of all, the degree of the identity map on SN is equal to one. Uh, and you know this is this is obvious, but it's since it induces the identity map Z to Z. This was just a property of induced homomorphisms. Second of all, if F is homotopic to G, then the degree of F is equal to the degree of G, since uh, homotopic maps induce the same map on homology. Here's one that takes a little bit more thinking, but not, not too much. Uh, if F is not surjective, then the degree of this map is equal to zero since, uh, well, F is homotopic to the constant map. Why is this? If, you, if a map F misses a point in Sn, then in fact, it, it lands completely in R, uh, Rn, and then you can just contract everything inside of Rn, and there you have it. The map is homotopic to a constant map. Constant maps induce the zero map in homology. So here's one we'll be using very often. The degree of F composed with G is the degree of F times the degree of G. And this just comes down to the fact that F composed with G star is F star composed with G star. And if you like multiply by two and then you multiply by three, you multiply by six, right? So like I mentioned, a lot of this is inspired by the lower dimensional example of S1. And we want to basically bootstrap our intuition of S1 up dimensions. To do this, we're going to need to understand how induced maps play with that boundary star map, because in the Meyer via Torres sequence, the boundary star map was the map that gave us the isomorphism between Hn of Sn and Hn minus 1 of Sn minus 1. So 
I'm just going to write down the, the theorem. I'm not going to prove it, but it's a straightforward diagram, Chase. So here's a proposition which we'll use in the near future. It's called the natu naturality of the connecting homomorphism. And it states that suppose uh, we have a commutative diagram given by, okay, so I have chain complexes, so this is of chain complexes. C star, D star, E star to zero, uh, C star prime, D star prime, E star prime, zero. Okay, so I have two exact sequences of chain complexes, and then I have maps kappa, delta, and epsilon. So this is, let me just write it here. The rows are exact. Okay, then the following diagram commutes for each P. Before I write down the next sequence, remember this was exactly our setup which we needed for the zigzag lemma. If you have a short exact sequence of chain complexes, then you get a long exact sequence in the homologies. This is what allowed us to define that boundary star map. And when you define that boundary star map, it turns out to play nicely with chain maps in that if I look at uh, the pth homology of the chain complex E, this maps to the pth homology of the chain complex E star prime by the induced map epsilon star. And this will map over to HP minus one of C star. Now this is that boundary star map. And similarly, since I have an exact sequence on the bottom, I get a boundary star map to HP minus one of C star prime, and this comes down by kappa star. Yeah, so the, the thing to remember is that boundary maps commute with chain maps, chain maps of short exact sequences. Great. So let's get back to some more geometric things. Let's talk about the degree of reflections. So let Sn be given by coordinates x1 to xn plus 1 in Rn plus 1 with the usual summation of all the xi squareds is equal to 1. Now, I can define a map R i from S n to S n, and it's going to be the map. You should read this as reflection in the ith coordinate. It sends x one, x i, x n plus one to x one minus x i, x n plus one. All right, so first of all, let's reduce, we're interested in the degrees of these maps. Let's just reduce it to thinking about one reflection. So uh, if Sij is the map that swaps Xi and Xj, then 
RJ is, okay, so what I do is first I swap I and J. So whatever was sitting in J is now sitting in I. And then I'll do RI. So I'll negate the thing in the ith component. And then I'll swap back. S uh, IJ. Swap them back. Okay. So then note that if I do SIJ twice, that is the identity map, right? So then the degree of RJ is equal to the degree of SIJ composed with RI composed with SIJ. And this degree breaks up, right? So this is the degree of SIJ times the degree of RI times the degree of SIJ. Uh, and now I'll swap things around. This is the degree of, all right, so this is just a product of numbers. So I'll swap SIJ and RI, but then that's SIJ composed with SIJ times the degree of RI. SIJ composed with SIJ is the identity. The identity map goes to one. This is the identity map. And so this is the degree of RI. So in conclusion, all of the RIs have the same degree. And so the question is, what is that degree? And here's the lemma. It states that the degree of Ri is equal to negative 1. And let's prove this. So what we'll do is induct on n. So for n is equal to 1, that is, we're now looking at S1. Take the generating one chain. Of H1. Given by. Okay, so I'll draw this in again. It just exactly winds around the circle once both endpoints end up at the same point. And this is going to have an orientation with it. Let's uh, send it over that way. Okay. Now compose this with R1. Okay, so R1 takes the first component, X, and negates it. So I'm going to flip like this. And let's see what happens to that one chain. So this goes to, okay, so R1 is now essentially going to, if you just look at each arrow, what happens when you swap? It flips the arrow. And we learned in the video on the relation between the fundamental group and the first homology group that if you take a path given by like a one simplex and then you take that opposite path, those two are inverses in homology. And so uh, 
when I reflected, the path went the other way, but it was the exact same path. And therefore, this is the negative in homology. So I sent the generator 1 to minus 1. And so the degree of R1 is equal to minus 1 on S1 in particular. All right. Now let's leverage this for an inductive argument. So uh, that concludes the base case. Now recall in the Maravilla Torres sequence, we found that Hn of Sn is isomorphic to Hn minus 1, to Sn minus 1. So we seek, and this was given by boundary star, we seek to make this compatible with the reflection R1. Uh, that is, we want the following diagram to commute. Uh, so we'll have Hn of Sn mapping by boundary star to Hn minus 1 of Sn minus 1. And Hn of Sn maps to uh, Hn of Sn by R1 star. Hn minus 1 maps to Hn minus 1 of Sn minus 1 by R1 star. Now, careful not to get confused. These R1 stars are technically different maps, but it, it makes sense here, which we'll see, because the R1 star on the bigger space is going to induce R1 star on the smaller space. So I essentially want this diagram to commute. This looks a lot like what we had in the naturality of connecting homomorphisms. In fact, that's that's why we did all that stuff. So let's let's get the setup necessary to use that naturality result. So let uh, fancy U be U union V. So this is an open cover of Sn. given by the usual way. So U is equal to Northern Hemisphere plus a little. V is equal to Southern Hemisphere plus a little. So note that R1 star actually preserves U and V. Uh, so that is, or, or rather, R1 preserves U and V. So, you know, for example, here is U, and then here is V. R1 is the reflection across that axis. And this works in higher dimensions too. R1 is going to be the reflection across this axis, and it preserves the northern hemisphere. It sends the northern hemisphere to itself, and it preserves the southern hemisphere. All right. Well, that's great because... R1 induces chain maps. This is the chain map we used to define the Meyer via Torres sequence. So C star of U, direct sum C star 
of B to C. So I'm going to use this use small homology again, which I said wouldn't pop up too often, but I guess I was wrong. Uh, so uh, lots of maps to write down. Okay, now R1 star sends U intersect V to U intersect V. And so it's going to induce some map on the chain level. And similarly, since R1 sends U to U and V to V, it induces maps on the chain level there. And since obviously R1 sends SN to itself, I get a map R1 sharp here. All right, now, by the naturality, of boundary star, we get a commutative map, commutative square of maps on homology given by, okay, so what did it do? It took uh, HN of this piece. And remember, U small homology ended up being isomorphic to our original homology. So it took HN of SN to HN minus one of U intersect V, but U intersect V is homotopy equivalent to SN minus one. Uh, and the result is that I'm going to get a commutative map by R1 star, R1 star, boundary star, boundary star. And so since the map on the right is multiplication by minus one, the only possibility for, uh, for the map on the left is to be multiplication by minus one. So since R1 star on the right is my, the minus one map, uh, and the diagram is commutative, R1 star on the left is a degree minus one map. Great. So I think that was kind of a neat argument. Um, but even more neat is going to be all the consequences we get from it. So recall that the antipodal map A from SN to SN is the map that sends A of, this is a vector in Rn plus one, to minus x. So if you think about it, this map is just n plus 1 reflections, right? Since this is a vector in R n plus 1, so we, swap, we just basically do R i n plus 1 times. So here's a corollary that we'll use over and over again. The degree of the antipodal map, I'll just say maybe it's on S n, is equal to minus one to the n plus one. 
Great. So let's get to some applications. Here is a proposition. The antipodal map Sn to Sn is isotopic to the identity or homotopic to the identity. If and only if n is odd. Okay, so one direction of this is is pretty straightforward. Suppose uh, let's do the contrapositive. The contrapositive is n even implies that a is not homotopic to the identity. Well, this is again easy because by the corollary. If n is even, then the degree of a is equal to minus 1 to the n plus 1. And if n is even, this is minus 1. Since the degree is not equal to 1 and degree is invariant under homotopies, the result follows. All right, now let's go the other way with it. Well, this is a nice uh, explicit construction. Suppose n is equal to 2k minus 1 is odd. Then there is an explicit homotopy given by h of x t is equal to okay, let's cosine of pi t x1 plus sine pi t x2 in the first coordinate. In the second coordinate, it's cosine pi t x2 minus sine of pi t x1. And it's sort of going to continue in pairs like this. So at the very end, I'll get cosine of pi t x 2k minus 1 plus sine pi t x 2k. So remember we're in s 2k minus 1 which lives inside of r 2k. So the coordinates do go up to 2k. And that's crucial here obviously. Uh, and then the last coordinate is going to be cosine of pi t x 2k minus sine pi t x 2k minus 1. So there's our map. All right, now I, I claim this does what, what I want it to do. Well, at t is equal to 0, h of x 0, let's write it this way, h of x 0, well, at t is equal to 0, all of the signs go away. And all of the cosines are equal to 1. And if you look what I wrote down, that reduces to the identity map. So this is the identity map. And h of x1, well, again, all of the signs are going to go away. 
But now the cosines are going to be negative 1. So I'm going to negate each coordinate, which amounts to doing the antipodal map. And so this is, well, it seems to be a homotopy between the identity and the antipodal map. The other thing you have to check is that really at every t, this is a map from Sn to Sn. And also, Hxt really does go from Sn to Sn, which you can check. This is well defined. To do this, you can check that the coordinates, the sum, <laughs> sum of the square of coordinates is one. So what's what's the deal here? Basically, these two are going to pair off uh, to give x1 squared plus x2 squared. And so when I sum all of the squares together, uh, I'm going to get the sum of the squares I started with, but since it was a point in Sn to start with, it'll always be a point in Sn. Great. So that is an explicit isotopy or homotopy from um, the identity map to the antipodal map. OK. So this gives us actually even more applications. So first of all, let's define an object. A continuous vector field. I'm not going to say the word continuous anymore. I'm just going to call it a vector field. Is a continuous map. Which we'll call V from Sn to Rn plus 1, so that at every x in Sn, V of x is tangent to Sn at x, which you can express algebraically. by if I take the dot product of v of x, that's a point in Rn plus 1, and x, that's a point in Sn, which I'll consider as a point in Rn plus 1, this is going to be equal to 0. Uh, so, you know, just some pictures. So, here is a vector field on S1. And so there's really not too many choices for a vector field on S1. At any point, you can essentially choose to go left or go right and your only other choice is basically like how big the vector is. So not too many choices there. Um, and I, I should say the, the continuity property means that these arrows don't jump around. So here I have this nice like continuous change of the tangent vector as I go around the circle. On S2, on the other hand, there's a lot of choices for a given vector. Here's one vector field. I can sort of choose this. Imagine I had like a perfect sphere and I uh, put it under a tap of water. You could just imagine how the water would flow. It would be something like this. And the same thing would be happening on the back.
So that's a vector field on S2. So as you can imagine, these objects play an important role in physics. You could think of like flux of some magnetic field or something. And uh, in differential geometry, they play a very important role. So here is an interesting property that a uh, vector field can have. The vector field is said to be non-vanishing if v of x is not equal to zero for any x. So over here, this is a non-vanishing vector field because it is never zero. On the other hand, this is a vanishing vector field because I have zeros at the top and the bottom. And in some sense, the, the non-vanishing ones are, are kind of interesting because the, the zeros kind of let you cheat. Uh, if you're not allowed to be zero, then everything has to sort of have a consistent direction it's moving in. But if, I mean, look at the bottom of that two-dimensional sphere. There's arrows coming in from every direction. So there's no choice of direction that's going to make it continuous for all the directions coming in. And you can cheat by just making it zero at the bottom. So non-vanishing is an interesting property there. Um, and we'll see in future classes that the number of zeros is also an interesting property. So here is a uh, important theorem. It's called the Harry Ball theorem because uh, it the the uh, plain language interpretation is that if you ever have like a tennis ball which is just all full of hair, and you want to comb it out, you can never comb it uh, in, a, in such a way that it won't create a cowlick. Like, there'll always be a little piece sticking off the ball. And you can imagine what that means in terms of vector fields. In fact, I'll tell you right here. Um, so it's that SN admits a non-vanishing vector field if and only if n is odd. So this aligns with what we've seen here. S1 is odd and admitted a non-vanishing vector field. S2, well, we didn't try very hard, but the first vector field they drew on there was vanishing. Okay, let's prove it. First of all, Let's do the easy direction. And this is going to be another nice explicit construction. If n is equal to 2k minus 1 is odd, then the vector field. So let me just remind you, this goes from Sn, which is S2k minus 1, to R. 2k is given by v of x1 up to x2k. This is a point in s2k minus 1. This is sent to minus x2, x1, minus x4, x3 all the way up to minus x2k, x2k minus 1. So, first of all, this is a vector field. Imagine dotting this with the original x1 to x2k. 
you're going to have everything cancel in pairs. Like the first two terms in the dot product are minus x1, x2 plus x2, x1. So uh, you're going to get the zero dot product. And also, this is non-vanishing because the point 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 is not in Sn because it doesn't have the sum of the squares being equal to 1. And so the formula guarantees that this is non-vanishing. Easy peasy. Okay. Now, the other direction is going to be an explicit homotopy like before. So let uh, suppose Sn admits a non-vanishing vector field. Okay, now if I if I have a non-vanishing vector field, I can create a new vector field given by w is equal to v divided by the uh, the size of v. So this is a vector field. with the nice property that uh, the norm of any given vector is equal to 1. And also, I guess I should check that this really is a vector field. Uh, w of x dotted with x is x dot v divided by the norm of v, that's x dot v, over the norm of v. The criterion that v was a vector field tells me that that numerator is 0. And so it doesn't matter that I divide it out by the denominator. Okay, So this really is a new vector field on there. All right, so let h of x, t be given by cosine pi t times x. So, so this x is in Sn, just to be clear. Um, plus sine of pi t times w of x. All right. Now, let's, uh, let's analyze this homotopy again at t is equal to 0, h of xt is the identity map. Uh, the sine goes away, the cosine is 1, so it's just h of x is equal to x. At t is equal to 1, h of xt, well, this is negative x, so this is the antipodal map. Moreover, um, I need to check that this is a well-defined homotopy, right? Um, the norm of hxt, well, this is the square root of cosine pi t x plus sine pi t wx squared. So I'll just write out the stuff in the square root. Well, okay, let's just, uh, let's look at all the terms. It's cosine squared pi t times x dot x uh, plus two cosine pi t sine pi t x times wx. plus sine squared of pi t times, running out of room here, but this is supposed to be w of x squared. All right, now let's look at each of these pieces. 
x dot x, x is a point in Sn, therefore it has norm 1, therefore the modulus of x squared is 1, so, so this is just 1, so I get cosine squared of pi t times 1, x dot wx, wx is a vector field on the sphere, so this is 0. And finally, wx squared, we constructed this so that it has norm 1. So this is sine squared of pi t times 1. And so this is equal to 1. And so all of these points really do live on the sphere. And this is a homotopy between the identity and the antipodal map. But then uh, a is homotopic to the identity, which implies that the degree of a is equal to the degree of the identity. The degree of A is minus 1 to the n plus 1, and the degree of the identity is 1, so n is odd. So in the last theorem, we used a vector field to get a homotopy between the identity and the antipodal map. We can do something similar if a map has no fixed points. So I'll kind of rush through this one because it's a little similar, but here's the proposition. It states that if f from Sn to Sn has no fixed points, then the degree of f is equal to negative 1 to the n plus 1. And the proof is uh, we can obtain a homotopy between f and the identity map, uh, sorry, and the antipodal map by this formula here, h of x t is equal to 1 minus t times f of x minus t of x. So it's, it's basically a straight line homotopy uh, divided by the norm of what's up there. So the norm of 1 minus t f of x minus tx. And the fact that f has no fixed points guarantees that that denominator is never going to be zero. Great. So uh, this is going to play an important role in our last theorem for the day. But this, this next theorem shows you how widely applicable this degree theory is. It even tells you about group actions. So recall that G acting on X freely means there is a homomorphism I'll call this action it's, I'm not going to use it again anyway it goes from G into the homeomorphism group of X uh, so that's the acting part and the freely part uh, is that g dot x is not ever equal to x unless, this is for all x, hmm. <laughs> for all x, g of x is not equal to x unless g is equal to the identity. So it each group element g moves the space around by some homeomorphism, and it must move every single point around. Remember, we use these to construct covering spaces, and uh, it's, it's what I think is one of the best ways to understand covering spaces. So here is a proposition which gives a severe restriction of groups acting on a space. So if f, uh, so if n is even, then 
Z mod 2z is the only non-trivial group which can act on Sn. So before we get into this, let me just say that the converse we've already seen that, that Z mod 2Z does act on Sn. It acts by the antipodal map. We use this to show that the quotient of Sn is Rpn, thereby showing that the universal cover of Rpn was Sn. But it turns out that's really all that can happen. And let's see why. Well, if F is a homeomorphism of Sn, then, well, the degree of F compose with F inverse. Remember, a homeomorphism always has an inverse homeomorphism. Well, this is the degree of the identity, but on the other hand, it's the degree of F times the degree of F inverse. Uh, and so this is equal to one. What does that tell me about the degree of F? These are two integers which multiply to be one. So this tells me that the degree of F is equal to plus or minus one. All right, so we then get a composed homomorphism Uh, and I'll call it D, it goes from G to plus or minus one. And the way this is defined is by this group action, I have a map into the homeomorphism group. And then the homeomorphism group maps on to plus or minus one, depending on if the homeomorphism what had degree one or degree minus one, right? Okay, now, if G acts on X freely, then by the previous proposition, uh, for all G with G not equal to the identity, D of G is equal to minus one to the N plus one, but we assumed N is even. And so this is exactly minus one. Well, what does that mean? Well, let's look at the kernel of this D map and D has trivial kernel, right? So nothing is sent to one except for one. If you think about how homomorphisms work, that uh, <laughs> this means it's an injective homomorphism. So G is a subset, a subgroup of Z mod 2 Z. Uh, and there you have it. The only subgroups of Z mod 2 Z are uh, the, the trivial group and Z mod 2 Z itself. So uh, Z mod 2 Z is the only <laughs> non-trivial group that acts on SN. So I should mention that the question of which groups act freely on uh, Sn for n odd is much more subtle. For example, way back when, when we were constructing these lens spaces, uh, we saw some actions of cyclic groups on uh, on Sn. So it's 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 a lot deeper and. Um, yeah, some of the greatest minds of math have attempted to answer this question. So that's going to do it for today. I hope I've convinced you that degree theory is a very powerful theory for uh, doing things on spheres. And next class, 
we're going to use this theory to build a homology theory so that degree theory is going to sort of permeate into the theory of all CW complexes. Looking forward to it, and I'll see you again next time. Thank <laughs> you.